going to go ahead and get started today. Thank you for being here. Um, we are going to have a great presentation by Dr. Gregory Maynard. Uh, Jose will introduce him in just a little bit. But what we wanted to do is go ahead and go around the room and uh, introduce ourselves briefly, uh, who we are and, and where we come from. I'm Alan Riddle. I'm the CMO of Mercy Medical Group here in Sacramento. Susan Ivey, UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Hi, I'm Steve Jackson with Jeanette. I'm a hospital systems manager supporting stroke. And I'm Diane Littlefield with Sierra Health Foundation. Olivia Castillo, Public Health Officer, Sacramento. Don Hufford with Western Health and Management. Carla, I don't think the mic. Yeah, it's not really doing it. Berkeley School of Public Health and Grace Presbyterian Church in Sacramento. From Ever Sundiga, Medical Director of California Health and Wellness. I'm Gil Simon, I'm the Medical Director of Sacramento Family Medical Clinics. Laura Schaus, I'm the Clinical Pharmacist at California Health and Wellness. Jerry Jeffy, California Chronic Care Coalition. Leonard Fry, LWF Home Care.
has made progress on formalizing Dr. Erdl's uh, survey monkey on hypertension uh, for the physicians and the MAs. Uh, so at this point in time, we have had the survey monkey um, uh, distributed to the Mercy physicians and MAs, the Sutter IPA physicians and MAs, and also Hill. And we're hopeful that uh, UC Davis will do that so we can get a comprehensive view of what's going on in Sacramento. We also had uh, UCLA and USC as well as healthcare partners express interest in Los Angeles in doing it. So um, we're getting some really good coverage of that. And yeah, so they're, they're, they're trying to do it the right way, which is pretty nice. <laughs> rather than just the expedient way, which is uh, pretty much uh, how it was initially rolled out. It was a good talk down in Los Angeles. It was a fun time. A very engaged group uh, of people, and uh, you know, how do we have practical tools so people can use to propagate best practices across systems uh, and do the right thing for all our patients. So that's what this collaborative is about. And I'm happy to be here. So Jose, do you want to make introductions? I can do it. Thank you, Alan. Uh, it's really a great pleasure. Uh, well, and by the way, thank you all for uh, giving up your holiday today, uh, well, this day, uh, to come and, and uh, join us. Uh, I think it's well worthwhile to do this. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think I've ever celebrated fun this day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a will, by the way. <laughs> so, three years ago today, the Columbus storm blew on shore in Oregon. I was there. So. You were there. So today, uh, we're very uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Gregory Maynard, who is the uh, clinical professor of medicine. Uh, he's also the uh, chief quality officer at UC uh, Medical Center. He uh, recently came up from San Diego, where he did yeoman's work there in San Diego with quality improvement, and also with his work with the, uh, uh, the just to get it right, is the um, Society of Hospital Medicine. He's an active hospitalist to, today. He still currently practices as a, as a hospitalist. And when he uh, was uh, leading the, the, the CMO for the, the hospitalist uh, uh, society, they uh, uh, were awarded multiple quality awards uh, for his leadership. And, uh, and, and he's bringing all of the knowledge that, that uh, he's created uh, from San Diego as well as from the it's the Society of Hospitalist Medicine to uh, UC Davis, and we're very excited about the kinds of collaborations that we're going to have uh, with uh, Dr. Maynard and UC Davis in the Right Care Initiative. So today he's going to uh, help us understand some of the uh, uh, clinical programs of preventing a very serious and, chro and chronic problem uh, that uh, confronts us all, uh, and that's hypoglycemia and managing tightly our diabetics. Uh, and the, the kind of uh, preventing the adverse drug event, uh, events that happen, unfortunately, too frequently in, uh, in uh, our patients. So with uh, no uh, holding back, uh, here is Dr. Maynard. Thank you. Get hypoglycemic from it. 
diabetes is becoming, uh, it really is an endemic health problem. Um, and the older you, you are, the more likely you are to have diabetes. Uncontrolled hyperglycemia is associated with poor outcome. And um, we do have a large number of patients on oral hypoglycemics and an increasing number of new agents as well as insulin. And that can be beneficial, but it does have a downside and too much of a good thing. Um, and hypoglycemia is also associated with poor outcomes. So it's finding that right balance, uh, appropriately addressing inpatient and outpatient glycemic control, and finding that sweet spot where they're also taking into account the things that cause patients to be hypoglycemic and trying to tailor the regimen to those circumstances. It's important also because hypoglycemia is the number one barrier to good glycemic control. People are afraid of it, uh, in some cases appropriately, in other cases maybe a little bit over the top. Um, but it is a, always a top barrier and there's always skepticism around the glycemic control project based on the sphere of hypoglycemia. That's a great slide, by the way. It really got my attention in yeah. the preview. And I thought about um, some of the, the family members I've heard from about that exact thing. They just, right. they, they are so, so frightened of the next hypoglycemic event. And it's not just the uh, patients. I mean, they're, they may, it's really doctors and nurses and us. You know, we're afraid of hypoglycemia. So we will tolerate sometimes too much hyperglycemia. And so it's, if you're knowledgeable enough, you can manage things in a reasonable way. Um, and it's a matter of building systems in place so that we can manage those things more consistently and have a win-win situation so you can get good glycemic control and low rates of hypoglycemia. All right, so this is the inpatient setting. It's one of the most common causes of inpatient complications. It's always uh, in most hospitals, one of the top three sources of inpatient adverse drug events. ADEs in general are really a huge problem, as you know, um, responsible for about a third of hospital acquired conditions. Over half of these are generally considered to be preventable, over half. Um, a lot of the ADEs are from hypoglycemic agents, and if you have a patient in the hospital on a hypoglycemic agent, they have about a 1 in 10 chance, or 1 in 9 chance of having a hypoglycemic event, an adverse drug event. <clears throat> Transitions are another place, so a lot of people come in after they were discharged and come back in with an adverse drug event. Again, more than half of these are thought to be ameliorable or preventable, and insulin oral hypoglycemic agents are one of those agents that cause those ADEs in a fairly prominent fashion. Uh, ED visits, so people coming in from their home or their skilled nursing facility or wherever they're living cause a huge number of emergency ED visits and emergency hospitalizations. This is especially true for the elderly. This is similar to admissions from delir delirium, dementia, cellulitis, or biliary disease. So this is not a minor issue. This is a huge number of patients going to our EDs and our inpatient setting as a direct result of the drugs that we give them. Um, again, the, the elderly are disproportionately affected by these things. So I'm going to talk first about the inpatient setting, and again, where I've had probably the most experience. Um, I told you over 10% of those with insulin or hypoglycemics have at least one, one adverse drug event. When I say adverse drug event, I don't just mean they had a low glucose value. I mean they had a glucose less than 50, and or they had bad side effects at an additional level of care. One of those symptoms that are listed there, and in some cases death. This is from um, high quality data done on a sampling basis by our government uh, that does this monitoring um, for adverse drug events across the board. So this is pretty solid data about how common this <coughs> is. All right, first question for you. What level of blood glucose constitutes hypoglycemia? Uh, less than 80, less than 70, less than 60, or less than 40? What's the definition of hypoglycemia? Do I hear an 80? 70? 60? 40? Okay. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> so less than 
70 is the ADA definition of hypoglycemia, and that's because that's when the physiologic response kicks in. Even if the patient's having no symptoms, this is the level where a lot of physiologic response often gets triggered, even in the asymptomatic patient. So this is typically what is defined as hypoglycemia in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Severe hypoglycemia has different definitions. Most of them mean that you have, they need outside assistance or it's less than 40. So that's severe hypoglycemia. Um, people have used, when you read the literature about hypoglycemia, you've got to be a little bit careful because people measure hypoglycemia in all different ways. And they have different cutoffs for hypoglycemia. So if you're trying to compare apples to apples, you've got to be real careful about you know, what percentage they're talking about. We'll talk more about the measurement of hypoglycemia later in the talk. All right, what are the risk factors? There's inherent risk factors for hypoglycemia. Uh, low BMI, infectia, advanced malignancy, age, liver, kidney disease, CHF, people one with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis have a very high predisposition to um, hypoglycemia and you have to be very careful with their insulin dosing. And then there's iatrogenic ones. Being on a agent, of course, is a hypoglycemic risk factor. And some risk is always going to be there, I think, no matter how careful you are. Um, but those problems are magnified when we don't really um, prescribe or monitor um, or administer these agents uh, appropriately, or we have overly aggressive targets depending on the situation. In most of the literature, and in my experience, hypoglycemia less than 70, at, at least half of those are preventable. At least half. At least half of those events. Severe hypoglycemia is less than 40 in the hospital. They are more like 80% preventable. In some cases, they're, they're calling for making these like a never event. We have several months of data uh, when I was at UC San Diego, where we went for several months in our ICUs with zero glucose, is less than 40. Um, and we're starting to see that at UC Davis as well in some of our ICUs. So many of these are completely preventable, and yet we have them happen again and again and again. And I'm going to point out some more concrete examples about how we can chip away at those numbers. Now, I'm talking about this whole talk about hypoglycemia. I just want to make sure you get, don't get the idea I'm saying don't get glycemic control. Okay. Glycemic control has had an up and down evidence history, but everyone agrees that reasonable control is a good idea and that you don't want to have people running around with glucose values over 200. All right? Let's all agree on that. Um, we can <coughs> argue about what the optimal glycemic control is, um, but everyone agrees it should be at least that reasonable. All right, what's the most powerful predictor for an inpatient to experience an iatrogenic hypoglycemic adverse drug event? Liver disease, advanced stage, and prior hypoglycemic event during the same stay or cancer? A, liver disease. Any other wrong answers? B. B. What's that? B. B. Any other wrong answers? C. All right, this is the right answer. Now, we can argue about this, but um, that I think in the studies I'm about to show you, where a lot of these preventable events come from is because we don't treat the first one right the first time. Okay, we, we not only do we not prevent the first one, we don't prevent the second one or the third one or the fourth one because we're not using our heads, we're not using systems. Another question, which of the following is not the top source of inpatient iatrogenic hypoglycemia? Nutritional insulin mismatch, decreasing steroid doses, failure to manage prior hypoglycemic event. I know that one's not it. Inappropriate prescribing of insulin. So everybody worries about this decreasing steroid doses. It's really a rare cause of iatrogenic inpatient hypoglycemia. It can happen, but it's not one of the top ones. All right, this is from a small study where they look at the etiologic factors of hypoglycemic face, uh, 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 events in the hospital, and they found a reduction in interal intake was a high percentage of the cases. 
In other words, somebody was eating, when they stopped eating, they got hypoglycemic, okay? Uh, or they were getting uh, two feedings, and then two feedings stopped. Uh, uh, insulin adjustment, 6% uh, steroid withdrawal, very rare. Unclear causes, 43% in this, um, which may be a definition issue. A lot of diverse causes, uh, medication error that we think <coughs> of, like you know, wrong dose, et cetera, that, that wasn't even on the radar in this one study. So the other thing they found was that poor hypoglycemia management followed this rule. Less than 50% had documented euglycemia within two hours of a low. In other words, half had no documented normal glucose after a hypoglycemic event at two hours. Average time to documented resolution was four hours. Okay. Now, I this was one of the first studies I read about the patient hypoglycemia, and I was like, that's ridiculous. That is terrible. I can't believe that's that bad. I'm gonna do a study in our hospital. That was a mistake. <laughs> That's what Dr. Erdl just experienced. He thought something, and then when you looked at the details, it was Shows you different. What you don't know. That happens a whole lot yeah, that's good. in the quality business. Um, so we did it a, a little bit differently. But in the previous um, literature, there were very little controlled studies, and it's hard to do a controlled study about what causes hypoglycemia. <coughs> but we did a case control study. So we did. We looked at 130 consecutive inpatients that were being monitored for glucose. And we looked at 65 consecutive cases with an iatrogenic hypoglycemic day. So they had hypoglycemia uh, during the course of a hospital day. And we, had, we matched them with controls that were on a similar hospital day. In other words, three days of hospitalization versus three days. So you weren't comparing a person in a hospital for three days with a person in a hospital with 30 days. And a variety of other those risk factors we talked about, like kidney disease, et cetera. We matched for a lot of those things. And they were not hypoglycemic, so that's how, that was the control. We examined the risk factors for hypoglycemia, and we also studied the treatment and adjusted adjustments made to prevent recurrence. So nutritional interruption and discordance was the number one cause, or num number two cause, I guess number three cause. Uh, well, there was a number two cause of iatrogenic cause uh, problems, and this was not routine NPO. This was this was not somebody who was going to surgery and they just held the day before they went to surgery. This was people who were on TPN or tube feedings who stopped, had those tube feedings stop, but the insulin continued, uh, and that is incredibly common. That is an incredibly common event in the hospital, especially around tube feedings uh, in the ICU. Um, the number one cause was the patient had a prior hypoglycemic day that was not appropriately acted on, or, um, ha at least half the time. Um, and then there were some prescribing issues. So mainly, if you know what the 50-50 rule is, where you have 50% basal, 50% nutritional, inpatient and outpatient alike, there's a tendency to just creep up on that basal dose um, to cover all the needs, both nutritional and basal needs. And when the patient stops eating, then they get hypoglycemic because they're not paying attention to that basic tenet of how you're supposed to prescribe insulin. Um, on the management side, we weren't as bad as that original study that I looked at, but we were close. We were really pushing hard to be as bad as that study. Uh, we did not follow our own protocol. We often had no documentation. We had prolonged times to resolution that were over two hours. <laughs> Frequent failure to prevent recurrent hypoglycemia. About two thirds of the cases had an opportunity where they should have done something in the judgment of it by our data extraction tool and our algorithm, but they did not do anything. And thus, the patient had another uh, potential to have recurrent hypoglycemia. So, when you read the literature, which is consistent with our studies, inappropriate prescribing, failure to respond to unexpected nutritional interruption. Poor coordination, and we'll talk about that a bit more, and failure to respond to a prior hypoglycemic event. Those are the top inpatient sources of hypoglycemia that you can actually do something about, right? These are all things you can do something about. 
this is this is our second study of hypoglycemia prevention. Our first one we showed that we reduced hypoglycemia by around 50 percent, and we improved glycemic control at the same time. That was just with order sets protocols. Um, then we came up with this. This was to show a more refined bundle where we kept working on this. And we showed that we reduced hypoglycemic stays by around 30%, severe hypoglycemia by 60, you know, 50 to 60%, recurrent hypoglycemia uh, by about 20 something percent. Um, uh, and days with severe hyperglycemia, that is a blood glucose greater than 299, that also came down at the same time. So again, what I'm saying is you can do both at the same time. You can get better glycemic control and better hypoglycemia um, at the same time in most hospitals. Uh, this is the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacist um, Foundation Panel, uh, which I was part of. They had they outlined their um, top high priority insulin errors in the hospital by phase. You see the prescribing is there. Um, under administering the relationship of insulin administration to nutrition is there and that's when for, for example we check the sugar at 4 a.m. the trays don't arrive until 7 or 8 and by the time that happens then the prior glucose didn't make any sense or we give them their insulin and then they don't eat for another hour and they get hypoglycemic and then those things all happen things like that uh, and then failure to appropriately monitor for insulin effects and adjust accordingly now that last part about monitoring isn't only about treating the acute hypoglycemic event, it's about how most hospitals don't track their hypoglycemia rates at all. They don't really know what their hypoglycemia rates are. They are tracking uh, voluntarily reported events. And believe me, that is not an accurate way to follow hypoglycemia rates. Uh, it's too dependent on who fills out report and you might think that it's 100% perfect but I can tell you it is not uh, because we've compared the two time and time again and you can do an educational campaign and the voluntary reporting will go up but the hypoglycemia will go down okay so they don't correlate all that well so if that's what you're using it's not enough um, for prescribing they're talking about using um, protocols protocol driven order sets for all these things, IV to sub-Q, sub-Q insulin pumps, post-discharge transition regimens, DKA order sets, hyperkalemia order sets that use insulin, you have to be careful because they can get hypoglycemia if you don't watch out. Post-cardiac surgery care, integrated hypoglycemia management orders into your order sets, and including decision support based on nutritional status. So that's one recommendation, this one recommendation encompasses several years worth of work in most hospitals because you have to come up with all these different protocols and try to implement them in a way that makes sense and it's not that easy to do. Recommendation two or three are to eliminate routine administration of sliding scale only regimens as a primary strategy to treat hyperglycemia. Recommendation three is to get rid of free text so most of us are going to electronic medical records that do get rid of most of the free text orders but you know, docs and residents, they have a way of going around the structured order sets and finding ways, and we have to sort of um, try to block those holes. So wherever possible, try to have protocol-driven evidence-based order sets and allow for prescribing, and yet allow for that, um, that, that flexibility so that they can adjust the individual patient's needs. All right, so anybody tell me what this does? I don't know what it does. <laughs> this was the staircase at the back of my uh, uh, hospital at UC San Diego. You're kidding. No. <laughs> that, that was a resident's exit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. That, that led right to the complaint department. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first uh, day I walked in, this is a, from the parking garage where the doctors park. You walk in, you can't walk into the hospital without seeing this. And the first day I saw it, I went, what the hell is that for? Right? That's a dumb design. 
I'm sure it used to do something. There used to be a door there, or they used to back up little trucks there or something. But clearly, it was not being used for that purpose now. I can show you the loading docks next to it. And every couple of years, they slap a fresh coat of paint on it. <laughs> Um, and I kind of forgot about it. After a couple of years, I walked by it, not even see it, right? This picture was taken by a hospital sign hired about four years later. And they, <laughs> they brought me this picture on their iPhone, and he said, what's this for? Um, and I remembered that I had thought the same thing. So for me, it's a really good sort of analogy of what happens when we walk into a new healthcare environment. Right now, I'm new at UC Davis. I'm walking in, I'm seeing everything brand new. I'm comparing and contrasting the sites where I've been. And I'm talking to people who've been there for 20 years. Um, and already, I'm losing my fresh eyes, right? And this is what happens, is we get used to dumb design. We start just working around it. We start going around it. So we've got to commit to looking with fresh eyes about um, what does it make sense for our nurses and doctors to do? What does it make sense for our patients to do? and redesign the system to get rid of those things. Um, because just working around them isn't the answer. And that usually takes uh, commitment, sometimes it takes finance, it takes a lot of ingenuity, for sure. Uh, but you've gotta look for these things. And I think uh, the way we take care of diabetes and, and hypoglycemia in the hospital has a lot of these things that were just there, like sliding scale only orders that were just there. They were embedded in every order set. You know, and they don't really make any sense, uh, but they were just there. So we have to redesign the system to get rid of those things. All right, so what best practices are we reinforcing? When you build a protocol, you've got to look at the universe of best practices, and you've got to squish it down into about eight or ten at the most, and then reinforce those over and over and over again to get the most reliable care. Uh, what a lot of people try to do is they try to get perfect, especially in the academic centers, They'll try to provide perfect guidance for something complicated, and pretty soon you've got a five-page order set, you know, that nobody will ever use. So you've got to really have some discipline and decide what's most important and hone down on the most important parts, and then find ways to reinforce those, not just in your order sets, but in education, monitoring, and audit and feedback, and on and on. So this is our attempt to put all those things into an algorithm. I think algorithms really help people work through the process. I know the first time we tackled this, we asked residents, we gave them cases, okay, this diabetic patient comes in the ED and he's on an oral hypoglycemic and insulin and he's got a sugar of 300, he's got a diabetic foot, and he's gonna go to surgery tomorrow, what are you gonna order? And they go like, uh, they didn't know. Like, they, I mean, they see that patient every day, right? They're writing orders like that every day, but they couldn't tell you how they were writing the orders. And this gives some structure to work through how you work through these day-to-day -day problems. It, it breaks it out by calculating the total dose, by if they're eating or not eating, if they're on uh, interval tube feedings, or if they're in PO, and it just kind of walks them through the process. And then after a while, it becomes second nature, and then after a while, they don't need the card anymore because now they've got a mental model that they, that they walk through. Plus, um, we try to build it into the order set, as I'll talk about. Can so, I just ask you, are you willing to share that with everybody? Sure, sure. We've, it's, it's all actually online already, so I'll show you where you can get it at the end of the